So I have a free gift for you. I realize that might sound a little sales pitchy, but legit free gift. I have a practice log which I've been using for a few years with my clients and for myself. I use it both for practicing my instrument, if I'm practicing piano or any other instruments I play, or for my workout routine. It's super simple to use and you can go download it for free at holisticpianoacademy.com. There's no catch. It's just something I've really found to be extremely beneficial in these very trying times to find some clarity and set priorities. So if there's something you'd like to avail, go to holisticpianoacademy.com. Hello fellow beings, welcome to Tapasya Loading, a safe space to attempt honest, raw and authentic conversation in homage to the ancient act of stoking a sacred fire. How are you doing today? Well, it's, um, um, I have been on the road since, uh, I mean, for, for pretty much all the last week with, uh, uh, with one of the academies where I'm teaching with final examinations and, and both entrance examinations, which is always an, an exciting time in the year because you're, you're messing around with the biography of, of people who are aspiring to make uh, a career in the, in the music business to some degree. Uh-huh. And uh, and that's always something exciting and something uh, that comes with a lot of responsibility. So uh, it's like today is is a is is a no teaching day. I'm basically just catching up with all kinds of office work and uh, making phone calls, da, 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 getting getting paper off the desk, basically. Gotcha. How does it feel for you to be on a jury of? teachers and educators who have that kind of uh well for lack of a better term power over deciding the future of young musicians um i feel you should never forget about the responsibility that you have yeah. and uh and usually i always try to uh to imagine what it was like back in the day when uh, when i would be in in kind of say similar shoes as these people that are playing for me mm-hmm. and uh, not forgetting the uh not f- forgetting where you came from and not forgetting that uh, you used to be a student as well or or better say i i'm still considering myself as a lifelong student of the, of the drums and arts and music and, and, and life so not forgetting about all of that and uh uh, is, is I think a, a very important aspect when you when you're in in a jury like that. Beautiful. Can we talk about that a little? Where did your musical journey start? Oh sure. Uh, you, how, how far would you like me to go back? As far as you uh, feel comfortable and relevant talking about. I mean, um, I come from from a household in which uh, music always was an important part. So uh, uh, my father was was a very I mean, although not professional musician, a very ambitious and, and serious, say, semi-professional player. And uh, both of my grandfathers uh, uh, did play music also and were very ambitious about that. My, my older brother uh, was playing music. So music was always an important part in our lives. And... Uh, uh, and there was also my my godfather who had played the drums um, uh, in a dance band after the war, and uh, and the and the drums were still there at the house of my parents. Um, I mean, they they were not actively set up somewhere; it was more or less in some remote place. But mm-hmm. I would find the drums, and uh, to me, it was my say it was one of my favorite toys. It, it was the place where I would go to and uh, and try. I mean, just like kids do, you 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 know, you you invent stories uh, and and you turn into a character uh, that th- that you are not. And 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 in the midst of uh, inventing all these stories, you are coming up with your own soundtrack that you produce on the drums. And uh, that was kind of like what I did. So that's the that's the very first memory that I have, and uh, mm-hmm. and that reaches back to say, I don't know my some somewhere at, at age of four or five. That that's somewhat the earliest memory that I have of that. 
Do you remember the sounds you grew up around? Your first memories of music, the kind of music you grew up around? Kind of music. Um, I mean, to a, a, to a large degree, um, I mean, the, the, the sources um, or, or the, the styles of genre where my grandfathers and my father came from was more or less, say, traditional um, brass band music, if you will, yeah. marching music yeah. in a very traditional German-like style, I should say. But, uh, but there was also um, a, a very important input, which, uh, and, and I don't think I ever have been talking about that, but as a, as a young kid, I, uh, I kind of fell down the stairs at, the, at my parents' house from oh. the very top to the very bottom. And when I arrived at the bottom, I couldn't speak anymore. The, the only thing I could still do was stuttering. Really? In a, in a very drastic way. So oh. no speaking anymore. It was, it, I was, I was literally w without voice. And when I tried to speak, I, I was so shocked about that, about that accident with this, with that set of stairs that I fell down that I couldn't speak anymore. Wow. So, uh, How old so were the, you? um, I wasn't into kindergarten mm -hmm. and, and I, and I remember how I fell down, but I have no memory of myself, uh, stuttering I, I i can't recall that it's just my my mom would tell me you were not able to speak anymore wow. and the doctors would tell her uh you need to sing with the kid as long as you can because when you're singing you can't stutter Amazing. that was it so, so what my mother would do she would uh she would sing with me from early in the morning from the point of where i woke up to the point of where we go to bed and, wow. uh, and she would sing with me most any song that you could imagine. And I have lots of memories of that, which also may account for the aspect that, uh, I think I'm pretty good with memorizing music mm -hmm. and, uh, and being exposed to all kinds of songs and singing and remembering music. That was a very important part to getting my speech back. And when I then went to kindergarten, I was still kind of stuttering, but it was, I mean, drastically improved. And when I then got to school at age of six, it was almost gone. Amazing. So, so the yeah. healing properties of music was something you were familiar with from the very early onset of your life. I would think so. I would think so. And it also goes to say how much uh, speaking and music and communication and health and your all around env environment and, and development as a kid uh, is uh, can be influenced in a drastically positive way by music amen to that which is, a, which is a very strong message i think i agree i agree i wholeheartedly agree um do you remember when you consciously decided to play drums for the first time in your life to consciously decided to play drums, you say. Yeah. yeah. It it wasn't. I mean, like as a profession, or to consider that. To, no, just generally sit down on the drums. Like, here's an instrument. I want to play this. Do you remember the first spark of in, uh, initiation into that process? I'm I'm not I'm not super sure uh, about the very first moment. I'm I'm. I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm able to recall that, but I was fascinated by the bass drum pedal, which mm -hmm. I still have. It's it's just it's just up there on the shelf. Amazing. And, uh, and I was fascinated by by the sound that uh, that a felt beater created on a cymbal, mm -hmm. and, uh, and by the sound of a felt beater as you uh, as you as you strike a tom tom. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah. So, so, and as I said before, it, it's, it's about that script of inventing your own stories with monsters, dinosaurs and whatever, and, and you're creating your, like your own story with that. Mm -hmm. It was, it was the, the fascination of, of that, which, uh, which I think came first and uh, it was, it was I think much later when I thought about drums being a, a musical instrument in which I am 
for the most part, accompanying other musicians, that idea only came way later. To, to me, it really was, it was a toy that I got fascinated with. And I don't remember that very first moment when I sat down and tried to play some of it. I mean, in the first place, I was, as a kid, you're always too small to sit down behind the drums and reach, every, and right. reach out to every instrument right. so, so that you can play it in a comfortable way. That, that was not the case. It's just a, you try to reach out to things as good as you can and, and, you, mm-hmm. and you, you approach it very much like from a standpoint of kid logic mm-hmm. uh, and not really uh, like, oh, I want to sit down and play the drums. <laughs> it's interesting that, that you mentioned that if I may sh- take a minute to share I was uh, watching uh, one of your solo performances last night mm. I think it might have been a Drumeo um, video or maybe another one I can't quite remember I went through quite a few, a few and I was watching it with my girlfriend I remember both of us saying that's one of the first things we talked about like when you play it sounds like a story so it's interesting oh, cool. yeah so it's interesting that you say that now. Uh, it's it's yeah, it, it's very evident to hear when you're playing that there's there's a script there, there's a story from the beginning till the end when you play. It's uh, so <laughs> it's very interesting to hear where the roots of this approach comes from. Thank you for sharing that. Um, how old uh, were you when you officially started playing drums, so to speak? Well. Um Starting officially, hmm. when when you say officially, you you have something specific in mind. Like, what would that mean? Uh, that's a good question, right? But at which point would um, would you say? Um, how, how did you? Or was it just something you always were doing all your life because of the musical background your family had? Were you just playing drums anyways, or was there a specific point in time where you actually, yeah? Sp- said okay i'm going to start taking drum lessons now i'm going to start being a drummer now forgive me if my Uh, question sounds too vague no 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 it's it's uh it's 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 a it's a good question actually it's just uh uh not always there there's an uh, there's a a very clear and concrete answer for it (laughs) yeah Uh, so so i remember the my, my father's brass band rehearsing um at our house for quite a while. And the place where my drums were set up was just in the room besides that. And, uh, and I remember quite sometimes when they would rehearse and I would try to accompany them, but they didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, nice. uh, and it was, it was me being around that age of five or, or six, maybe something like that. And, and I had been fooling around with the drums as I mentioned earlier, some, starting somewhere between the age of four and five. That's the oldest memory that I have when I started playing yeah, drums. That's very young. But uh, it, was, uh, it was only much later when I started taking the first, uh, f- say, formal drum lessons, which was mostly inspired by the aspect that, um, I mean, as, as a kid, I would grow into that brass band that my father and my brother and and my grandfather w- was into mm-hmm. and uh and, uh, and i mean since i had no musical education in the broadest sense i hadn't taken any drum lessons in whatever shape or any music lessons by then uh, except the, the the clarinet lessons that i had with my father say somewhere when i was seven or something like that mm-hmm. i guess mm-hmm. Um, but no drum lessons at all. And I was struggling with all kinds of things. And, uh, and of course, everybody in that brass band that I mentioned would know better than you. And, uh, yes. there would, somebody would come around, oh, you, you, you take, you, you're picking the sticks in the, in the wrong way. You do this. And, uh, on that tune, you need to play that. And, uh, no, you're, you, you need to play like this. No, you need to play like that and do this. And you're, you need to play a role in that. I said, what is that? And I, I didn't know anything. So, uh, I mean, not to speak about interpreting written, written music. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was out of that necessity that I was looking into drum lessons, which I was very afraid of because uh, uh, I thought, boy, I will never make it to, to really read music. Ah. I, I feel I, I will be struggling with that. I, I was really afraid of that, I can remember. Uh, and um, anyhow, that, that was, say, somewhere around the age of 
11, when the, when the music I began to play in that marching band was starting to be a little bit more complicated with more room for interpretation in the music and, uh, and also with, uh, uh, with that band going out to, uh, to, uh, to play little events that you were invited to also join in. And uh, of course I couldn't play until late at night. So another drummer entered like after a certain timeline and- uh, uh, Cause of age restrictions? Yes, sure, for age restrictions, wow. yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, no. Um, and um, it's, um, and boy, what then? So yeah, my first formal drum lesson say somewhere around age 10, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and from there, a, a lot of things uh, gained quite some momentum because the teacher that I had back then was, I mean, he, he, was, he was living in the, in, the, in the same town, in the same little village. And he was, uh, uh, I, I still suppose he was most likely the, the, the best teacher that I could have around that time. He was not classically trained. He was mostly a drum set player mm -hmm. uh, who was playing drums for, for a living, really a, a professional professional drummer mm -hmm. who was playing in all kinds of, of rock bands back then in which he would play, say, mostly original music, but also then cover stuff of whatever style and genre. Mm -hmm. And I would, I mean, for the, for the, say, next 10 years, uh, have a, a pretty close relationship with him, also including teaching at a private music school that he would open then mm -hmm. at a later point in time when when my teacher came back from Los Angeles where he had studied um, at the Musicians Institute mm -hmm. and uh, and I kind of af after my, my my service with the with the Red Cross back then you could make your choice if you go to the army or if you do some sort of social work right, right i decided for social work i did not go to the army and uh, and uh, before that i made an apprenticeship still and finished school all in the very official very normal way right and after that um i basically quit my job and started working for that private music school and that was when i turned into a professional drummer more or less playing in all kinds of of bands, whenever somebody needed a drummer, I would say, yeah, I can do it. So I ended up playing all kinds of stuff from still maintaining that thing in that, in that brass band where I had started out many years ago to, uh, to all kinds of semi-professional dance bands, rock bands, where I played original music, salsa bands, percussion ensembles, anything you could think of. <laughs> I did it with very few exceptions. <laughs> Amazing. That's beautiful. Uh, there's a specific uh, point in your story that, that I personally find very curious. You mentioned something about your fear of reading music. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a fear that still exists, but it's a fear I share very commonly. Um, I had a similar experience. I grew up uh, being trained. Uh, I'm, I'm primarily a pianist and a composer. But uh, I was an apprentice to um, a percussionist, a Latin percussionist, who uh, taught us rhythm in a very specific manner, wherein your body is your primary guide. Um, this was in my late teens. And then when I moved to Europe to study music formally, I went to Berkeley's German partner at the time. Um, my teachers in the beginning were very happy with my timing, as they uh, would call it, which I personally find a very vague term, by the way. But, um, and except in the so-called rhythmic lesson, um, I flunked my first year because it was all reading. And uh, it was, that was my first, uh, even though I've uh, spent parts of my childhood in Europe, this was my, like, this was the first time I was interacting directly on a musical uh, format. And it was my first culture shock wherein I stood there going into a rhythm class and then the next thing I know I'm given a sheet of paper which I'm supposed to read from. I was completely at a loss. Is this something, uh, is it, it, or this tradition of looking upon rhythm as black dots only, there are generations of drummers and musicians who've grown up thinking rhythm is primarily black dots on white paper. What is your st stand on this? Well, my, my standpoint on this, interesting question. I mean, first of all, um, 
uh, that that fear uh, that I had about reading and interpreting music that I had back then, mm -hmm. it doesn't exist anymore. Excellent. Uh, I want to ask you more about how you got over it. <laughs> I mean, in, in the meantime, I, I would rather consider it as as one of my one of my strong points. But but that's a, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But uh, say, if I were to uh, express my standpoint in a nutshell, I would say any any piece of written music is always subject to interpretation. Any right. piece of written music is uh, is some sort of uh, a shorthand for a musical idea that somebody else had in mind mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and I think that the true art comes in to the game uh, when you have somebody breathing life in, into that arrangement of, of ink on the paper Beautiful. And, uh, and I would even think that uh, if you play a certain piece Ten times, I would not think it should sound the same every time around. Mm -hmm. I, I could easily imagine to have it sound like a little different every time, depending on the mood that I'm in, depending on the energy in the room, depending on the people that I perform with, depending on the audience that is listening to me, mm -hmm. depending on how the room smells, depending on how the room sounds, and depending on the... the my instrument and, and its condition, which is not the same everywhere you go. Um, exactly. So there's a lot of things that that account for all the differences that come to interpreting written music. Beautiful. And, uh, and, and there's a, a lot of evidence. Uh, I mean, even going back to the to the 1700s, um, even here with, with Western music, in which people would say, it can't be the same every time around. It it exactly. is supposed to be different, and uh, and a lot of people are just stuck with that idea that there is only one way to play a certain piece of music, and it should be the same every time around. And they even consider that as some sort of special quality that it should have, right. which I think is lame. That's not true. That's not that's not art. And art was never about perfection in the first place. Art right. was always about authenticity and art was about um, uh, say, con connecting your, your soul and your very personal expression with the music that is possibly on the bandstand, in, on the music stand in, in front of you uh, or not. Maybe it's just in your head, but you got to give it some meaning mm -hmm. and that's, I think, way more important. But... Of course, there is no way around interpreting music which somebody puts in front of you because I noticed it's a very vital part of making a living as a musician. Right. And it helps to analyze your own playing. It helps to, to capture ideas when you're practicing in a real quick way. Oh, let me, let me just quickly write that down. Because, I mean, that's, that's the easiest way to, uh, to visually uh, understand the, the relationship between different rhythmic layers and all of that, which right. may be hard right. to do in a very abstract way. Absolutely. That resonates deeply with me. I'm, I'm from the same camp. Um, I'm curious, though, that sensitivity and awareness for that, for, for these aspects towards the music, that realization, how has that journey been for you? How, what was the journey that led you to this conclusion? It, let, let me say it was not planned for. It was uh, right. it, it was something which is um, uh, you know some some things just come to you mm -hmm. and uh, and you got to be aware of them and uh, and uh, you may have your personal dreams and, and goals and uh, things that you would like to reach out for mm -hmm. and of course you're working towards that. But there is also the the dynamics and the momentum uh, that other things do in your both in your personal life as a human being, but also in your musical life as an artist. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that you possibly do well, and you're not that much aware of it. But uh, other people are, and that creates a momentum that may even push you towards the totally different 
side of, of, of things and not towards the direction that you think you should be heading for. Right. And, uh, and life is somewhere in between. Life mm -hmm. is somewhere about finding a compromise with what you would like to be and where you would like to see yourself and, uh, and where life pushes you. Very it's somewhere in yeah, yeah, and, that makes uh, a lot of sense. People you you meet along the way, uh, and the the mentors and the and the teachers and the the people that are dear to you and the people whose advice you uh, 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 you choose to consider, they have a strong impact on all of that. Beautiful. So, what what would your advice be to younger musicians who are seeking to figure out that balance? A lot of them don't even know about this balance that need to be struck. I'm looking at like, a lot of younger people. I find this exceptionally interesting in your case because you didn't grow up in New York or Los Angeles or London. You grew up in um, a more, up, for lack of a better term, obscure part of Germany. And yet you, here you are being one of the world's best. So what would you say has been the, if you could boil it down to one factor that kept your energetic perspective on focus on this essential part of music, what would it be? How did a kid from an obscure village in Germany make uh, it there? Because there are so many out there who don't. What, did you, what, what made you different? Just what made me different? Um, and I, I'm, I'm genuinely curious when I ask this. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would possibly say, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm not even sure if that's the only thing, but that's something that, that comes to my mind right now in the first place. It's, uh, it's the awareness of what I refer to as uh, the game zone and the drill zone. Mm-hmm. The game zone is something uh, in which you just enjoy what you do because because you do it and you like it and you love it, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's be and and it's mostly that area, the game zone, in which you enjoy something so much that it makes you also go to the drill zone. Right. It makes you go to a zone in which you would like to further understand the exact details of something. Mm -hmm. You would like, would like to understand the, uh, the why and how and what if, and you would like to understand the set of rules, which is obviously connected with, uh, with playing a certain instrument, mm -hmm. and you, and you want to learn these rules. And once you do that, and once you study, and once you just take advice from the best and, uh, and, and you, and you, you dive to the bottom of the pond, literally. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. and once you did that, you need every now and then you, you need to go back to the game zone and in the game zone, there are no rules. There is no right or wrong. There's just the, the pure joy of playing the instrument because you like it so much. Amazing. And, uh, and it's, and it's, it's the, I think the awareness of, of both of uh, both of these spheres, uh, number one, maintaining the love for the instrument and uh, and and the motivation and the inspiration that comes from there, mm -hmm. but then also going into the drill zone and uh, understanding the set of rules. Uh, and once you understand once you understand the set of rules, you go back to the game zone and you break the rules. Beautiful. But you can also you can also break. You can only break the rules once you understand them. So true. So and, true. And uh, and I and I meet a lot of people uh, who consider themselves breaking the rules, but uh, actually they they may not even know the rules. It's not the same. Yes, I completely agree. Yeah. See, oh man, I love this conversation. This is this is lit. Like everything you're saying right now resonates so deeply within me. Can we talk about practice? Because this, uh, when you refer to this, the first thing that comes to my mind is, what's the best way to nurture that system and that fundamental set of tools, wherein the rules are s so deeply set within our bones that breaking them comes across as a natural counterbalance to the same. How did you work on this on your own? And how do you think is the best approach in this day and age to get there? Hmm. 
Um, good question. Um, I'm looking forward to your answer. I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. I mean, uh, when you when you practice, um, and and I say and I say this to all of my students: when you practice, you actually teach yourself. This is why teaching and practicing both follows the same set of rules. Mm. It's just when you teach, you, I mean, you, you teach a third person, obviously. When you practice, you teach yourself. That makes but so the, much sense. But the mechanics that you use for both of these scenarios are actually the same. That is mind-blowing. How did I not realize this? All, all, I mean... <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but yeah, the mind blown. <laughs> so, so that, that's, I think the, the, the first thing you, you need to understand. Mm -hmm. the, the second thing is, um, when you practice, it's, uh, it's about making, I mean, there, there, there may be a, a, a long list of rules that you can keep in your mind, but, uh, but to, to a very important part, it's about making choices because you cannot practice everything on every day. Yeah. That's, that's very important to understand. And uh, it's also important to, uh, to understand that you will not be, uh, I mean, your, your, your drumming skills will not decrease drastically when you don't practice for a day. And it will not decrease drastically when you don't practice for 10 hours every day. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's a lot of myth and a lot of stories uh, in which people connect a lot of, say, psychological burdening even with, uh, with yeah. their practicing, which I don't think is good. Yes, I agree with you. Um, another thing is, I mean, when you make your choice on what to practice, uh, you need to, uh, uh, I mean, you, you need to find out about priorities, say, what is, what is next in my, what are my next goals in my personal development as a musician? Am I just trying to play that groove in, of the song so-and-so in my band, blah, 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 mm -hmm. uh, or, is, or what are like my, my next important achievements do I try to master? Do, do I try to, to, to get accepted from a musical institute, an academy, a university? So is there something like an exam that I have to pass? And, and, that, and is that connected with a, with a set of requirements that I need to have down? And what are these requirements? And who are possibly the teachers that I think are most important in forwarding that collection of knowledge to me. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's about making choices and it's about tracking down uh, both the, the people who have that knowledge. It's about uh, uh, organizing your life in a way that all roads lead to that point in time mm -hmm. of I want to pass that examination mm -hmm. or I want to be successful as a musician and, uh, and, and make a living out of just playing music, not delivering pizza or doing something else. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to play music. If that's your goal, okay, what can you do to get there? It's about making, making plans. Where do I see myself now and in a couple of months and maybe in a couple of years, if you, if you try to envision that, fine with me. Some people can do that. Some people don't. Mm -hmm. I would, I mean, encourage everybody to dream big. Mm -hmm. Why not? Uh, and, okay. uh, and try to take measures that, that lead you there and organize your practicing uh, in a way that it leads you to that point. Well, what are your words of advice with your students or colleagues uh, for striking that balance between clarity and planning, like game plan, but also letting it flow, letting, letting the music take its own time to really kind of become a part of our lives, the progress and the growth. Because that's something I've often found myself, myself struggling with and also see it in a lot of uh, students I mentor mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah. Is there anything specific you can suggest? Or uh, I mean, that in itself is almost like an oxymoron. But uh, what's your general yeah. take on that, that balance between the cerebral and the intuitive? 
Um, hmm. I mean, the, 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 there, there, there's quite a lot of, of say, concepts that, that people use to, uh, uh, hmm, to, uh, to, to, to unfold these, these, th that mystery, I would mm -hmm. say, of, of, of reaching out to untapped potential mm -hmm. to me it it uh, uh, to a good part it was connected with uh, trying to not be afraid of making mistakes exactly. and that's that's something that that i say a lot of times and uh, and and i remember when when you would be in a lesson with uh, with chapin mm -hmm. he was never afraid of making mistakes mm -hmm. i mean at at times it was just great what he did and uh, but 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 jim was was never afraid of making a fool out of himself. He would just go crazy when it, when he had some. I mean, the, the no matter how strange the idea was, he would try it out, and possibly he could play it, mm -hmm. but possibly he could not play it. And and he was never afraid of making mistakes. It was always the the love for the instrument and the love for music, and uh, and uh, and just being inspired and motivated by just that mm -hmm. which kept him from from being afraid of making mistakes so fearlessness and, uh, yeah it's it's something about you you need to be fearless true and uh um and 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 you and you should try to not hide behind the music some oh, people are hiding uh Behind. Guilty as charged. That was me in my teenage years. Guilty as charged. <laughs> I would hide. I would so hide behind my piano. And uh, yeah, and, and it and it's both in a in in a physical way. I mean, like Indeed. people are hiding behind their instrument, really. Mm -hmm. uh, just in just uh, as well as hiding behind the notes you play. So, I mean, think okay. with thinking like. Uh, uh, Oh, I play this in that pattern. I play this in that groove because I I know it's it's considered to be pretty complicated. And when I play that kind of okay, people will accept me as a skillful musician. Wow, so true. Which I which I think is uh, is totally the wrong way. And of course, we are more. I mean, most likely we are all guilty of that to some degree. But trying to get rid of hiding behind the music that you play and hiding behind the instrument mm -hmm. in a in a very physical way that is super important you you need to uh, uh i mean dare to be yourself be authentic be the person that you are and once you dare to expose yourself mm -hmm. and which even includes uh showing a certain amount of weaknesses it it will not turn out as a weakness it may even turn out to be the strong side of your performance so true so true vulnerability yeah i'm just gonna check sorry I'm, i I just want to respect your time make sure i'm uh, i have a because yeah, yeah. a lot of these times i get so lost in these conversations i have no idea how long we're talking <laughs> we had a common friend on a few months back stefan maas hmm. We were talking for almost three hours, quite an episode to edit. So um, I just <laughs> want to make sure uh, I have some idea of time uh, while we're doing this, which uh, actually is relevant to my next question. Um, I still heard some of this in the last thing you said, timeline, you know, again, at the risk of sounding repetitive, when we uh, go into college, music college, or do undergo a mentorship program, what we basically given are a list of tasks and assignments that need to be finished on a specific deadline, right? In a way, and I'm just thinking out loud here, it's almost contradictory to the, to the longer journey, which is about give, you know, not to rush it and let the music really integrate itself on its own. Because music has its own energy, right? It has its own. I look about it. For me, it's an entity on its own as well. For it to also engage on its own terms and integrate itself in our lives on its own terms. I've always find that a dichotomy very challenging to navigate, especially as a uh, music student. When I was younger, in my 20s, that was one of my biggest challenges. And I wonder often, uh, some of the kids I mentor, how do you feel is the best way to help them do that? Hmm. 
striking that balance between hard deadlines but also not being too hard on yourself <laughs> that that is difficult and i think in a student teacher relationship it is also important to consider the person that is in front of you because you run into students which uh, which are very disciplined and uh, and they are already pretty good with keeping certain timelines and deadlines once you give them like a, a certain task to do like learn this piece we're going to talk through it and there's going to be an examination in i don't know 6 weeks from now mm -hmm. we're going to work through it step by step but uh, but you need to perform it by then that's going to be the date right and uh, some some people do master that in a pretty good way I'm, and i'm not speaking about how they finally do and and what mark they get mm -hmm. uh, but i'm just saying they are pretty good with organizing themselves towards that deadline mm -hmm. and with other people they may want to be able to do it but they they rather look at it as like a huge burden on their shoulders saying and, and at a, at a at a certain point they may they may even crash psychologically exactly say, yes which i see more often in just in in recent years yes it's a pattern right it keeps getting more intense that psychological pressure which uh, seems to be on people has uh, has drastically gained importance mm -hmm. and, and and relevance and uh, and trying to help students to maneuver through these shoals of psychological pressure which is on them mm -hmm. has uh, become a more and more important part of of mentorship i feel The other thing is um the aspect of hmm, of relevance is something really relevant to a certain student or is it just something on the side yeah and i try to uh, to respect the personality and the and the interest and the uh, personal skills and, uh, and and all the stuff that a student already brings i try to consider that when i when i put down uh, certain requirements and deadlines and uh, and goals to reach i don't have like that very same set of assignments that that i put out to every student that i teach Beautiful. it's not the same for everybody it's a, it's a little different every now and then and there are certain students which i allow for more freedom and there are certain students of which i notice oh he he really needs i mean very clear fences And I would say, okay, you go from here to here. That's the area in which you move. This is your direction. You you can go in between the fences, but you never climb the fences. You stay here. Boundaries. And with other people, I just tell them, okay, here's your area. Enjoy the game. Go. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. So it's to to some degree, it's it's about you as a teacher. You need to read students. You need to read people. And uh, of course, at times you do misread them. Mm -hmm. Happens, mm -hmm. but uh, there's always room to to readjust things. Here's a slightly provocative question: Would you consider yourself an exception as a teacher with this approach of yours, or do you see more of your colleagues, like education colleagues, also taking a similar approach? <laughs> um. I, I I wouldn't I, I'm always having trouble with uh, um, <laughs> say call, calling myself something like not calling myself so, something like exceptional. Okay. I, I usually, usually never do that. I know there there are colleagues of mine who uh, who follow a, a a similar mindset mm -hmm. and uh, and similar strategies as teachers and as mentors, mm -hmm. but. I also know that there are people who follow a very different path. Mm -hmm. I I do respect both, and uh, it's just personally, I'm not convinced that a very strict and rigid way of taking people by the neck and okay, right. in the cold water that right. that may be cool for person A, but it may be not cool for person B, C, D, E. Exactly. Which is why I think it's important to read music. And as a teacher, it's a. Uh, <laughs> I usually come up with with that comparison. It's a uh, you know, the the fish has to like the bait. It's not about the fisherman. Ah, oh, wonderful. 
Is that is that your own? Is, did you come up with that cell yourself? Or? Uh, I don't think so. I, I guess I have read it somewhere a long time ago, but uh, I I frankly don't remember where, and I I, I don't know who put it out. Well, it, no it works. It works. I'm gonna have to remember that one. It's about the fish and not the fisherman. So beautiful. Um, so how has um, life been as an educated? since the pandemic, I mean, the whole world changed and especially music education. Right. I mean, musicians anyway, the life of a musician has undergone major changes. Mm, but for, for the sake of some degree of focus, we, I'm going to stick to the educational part of it because um, as we know, by the way, I, I'm German too, uh, although I'm currently in India with my family oh. and I, uh, I've, I've worked, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, and I, I've worked in the system too and I noticed um, as you probably know yourself um, for us in Germany uh, we have been one of the most more conservative digital cultures in the past and since the pandemic a lot of change has undergone and it's it's a huge topic right now amidst my circles too like where is digital education uh, headed and is this a legitimate format and uh, a lot of controversy around this. I'd be very curious as to how your experience has been making that um, uh, shift. All in your case, it probably hasn't been a huge shift since you were internationally active for the whole time anyway. Uh, but how have your experiences been overall making so much of your lessons and your teaching available online since the pandemic hit? Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in, the, in the first place, I was... I mean, I, I was lucky to notice that uh, my life actually didn't change that much in, 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 yeah. in a couple of ways. Uh, I mean, the, the, the good thing was that <clears throat> even before, uh, before the pandemic started, I was teaching quite actively online. I mean, it wouldn't be like uh, the, the majority of my teaching, which was still for the most part in, in a one-on-one -on -one setting in my in my studio here uh, mm -hmm. again we're still with with people from all parts of the world coming in from from Asia the US and all, all parts of Europe mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the good thing was my uh, uh, I mean my my little online setting here was already working so when the pandemic Beautiful. took over th there was no cut in my in my work, right. more or less, it was just, it, right. it completely shifted to online. And uh, although one-on-one -on -one teaching is allowed now, uh, again, here with the, with the numbers being very low at this point, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, still I have uh, days and at times even weeks in which nobody is coming to my studio and it's all taking place right. online. So a typical right. teaching day would be like in the mornings I have, I may have, two people from Australia and then somebody from China, possibly somebody from India, possibly somebody from, I don't know, the, lots of UK students. I don't know why UK got so pushed. I no idea. There is Spain, France, Poland, Italy, la, 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 Nigeria I had two weeks ago. Uh, and then usually towards the evening, late afternoon, it switches over the big pond to the uh, to the U.S. with I mean people from from east to west, and uh, mm -hmm. that could be a, a, a typical day teaching online. Beautiful. So the the only thing which drastically changed was I mean the of course the the traveling went away. Right. All the all the international in presence work with I mean hosting master classes and, and drum clinics and, uh, and and drum festivals uh, mm -hmm. in, in which you would take part. I mean. All of that fell apart. I mean, from from one day to the other, more or less, which right. is now slowly coming back. Late summer and and, and fall this year. Uh, I think online education uh, will possibly never completely replace uh, a a true one on one setting with two people in the same room. It's still a different vibe. It's a different quality of how you forward. Uh, mm -hmm. knowledge uh, to another person. The the experience mm -hmm. you have with two people in the same room is, I mean, there, there is nothing like that. But 
teaching online has turned out to be something that can be very close to that. And it comes with a lot of, say, uh, advantages that a lot of people don't get to see. I mean, I can, I can share written music like, boom, just by pushing a button. Right. I can right. record something just like that and, and share the video. I can, uh, uh, or l- l- let's say e- even with my students, there, there were some students that uh, even drastically improved their, their yeah. skills during the pandemic because it allowed them to focus much more on certain things and, and keep other, say, disturbing influences out. Right. Some of them were really profiting and some were really good with organizing themselves within all of that, while others mm-hmm. were struggling with technique and uh, uh, being lost in video games and not knowing what to do next. And all of a sudden, the, the day is flying by right. and you didn't do anything at all. Right. So the, 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 the pandemic, in certain ways, it did amplify certain things which... Uh, uh, which were already there before the, the the students who were good with organizing themselves before i mean they also did great during the pandemic and the ones who were struggling before were now struggling even more mm. just saying <laughs> yeah there a wise man said um, it's all of this it seems like everyone's just being more of themselves since the pandemic hit <laughs> <laughs> What would you say um, in the future, do you see online education here to stay or is this just a passing fad in your opinion? I, th- I think uh, it's going to be here to stay. It will possibly decrease a little as, uh, as the pandemic situation is hopefully going to, uh, to improve in, in a mm-hmm. step-by-step fashion. But I think... Uh, we will see uh, the, the, the staying power of online education. And uh, I think we will also see a drastic improvement of online education. I think it can't just be, okay, here's a video, download it, and uh, then pay me right. loads of money uh, because uh, right. the video is good. That's not right. it. it. It has to go to a different level. It has to... Uh, it has to be structured way better than it is with most of the on- online platforms right now where you have a lot of conflicting information, a lot of redundant information, a lot of, uh, at times, not even legit information. And, uh, and it, it kind of follows the same mechanics as all these conspiracy theories do. Somebody puts out an opinion and, uh, mm-hmm. and once the opinion is out, it's kind of hard to, to take a different standpoint. And it's kind of right. hard to say, no, that's not true. What you say is simply just not true. That's not true, legit, consistent information. Stay away from it. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but, but it, again, it, it follows the same mechanics as all, as, as all the, I don't know, birds are fake. The earth is flat. No, the earth is hollow. The, uh, the, the chemtrails and, and all of that. And uh, no, there, there is no, there is no uh, global heating. There is no such thing like that. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it, it follows the same mechanics. And, uh, and I think... Because it's the same medium putting, it all, putting all the information. It's just, a, yeah. it's just one, one common field, yeah. one medium putting out all the information. Out yeah. there. And, and, and once people put themselves out of a certain set of rules because they they feel restricted to a certain degree and they feel not at home and they feel like not part of something they they at a certain point they may come up with their own rules they may come up with with the rule that uh the sky is green the right. sky is not blue and uh you mm-hmm. should just reach out and research uh th- there's quite a lot of people also being of the opinion that the that the sky is green just check this out if you think the sky is blue oh poor you you but again you you just follow your set of rules but we are the chosen ones who found the, that one and only piece of truth uh mm-hmm. which i think is dangerous yes that that that's going to get pretty complex in the near future i think 
What your um, words of advice to fellow educators and musicians in upping their game as far as offering their services as an online musician or educator are? Um, so um, my answer to to some degree will may be connected with the uh, um, uh, with little piece of, uh, of of say advertisement, <laughs> I should say, uh, because absolutely that's what we together with a with a student of mine. Uh, and uh, and my cousin Annika, we put together a platform which is uh, which is called Open Minded Drumming, and uh, because we felt uh, there are certain things that need to be improved about online education. So with uh, with Open Minded Drumming, we try to take out that uh, that uh, we we try to reduce. A, a, let's say redundancy of, of certain things. Okay, we all know you should play your instrument as relaxed as possible, but I don't need to say this a hundred times from a hundred different people. Uh, it's maybe five times around, we'll possibly do the job just as well. Mm -hmm. Same goes for uh, uh, trying to make a direct connection with the users of a platform, which is why we put up, say, monthly meetings with all the users where everybody can connect with us and direct mm -hmm. our answers, I mean, directly to us. We are sitting Community. In, that, in that meeting and we are everybody's questions. Uh, and uh, and we are and we are putting all these these live meetings to an archive. So in case you can't make it for the meeting, you go to the archive and you and, and you check it out at whatever point in time when when you're free to do so. At the same mm -hmm. point, we are looking into uh, say uh, supplying information which is not conflicting, and uh, and this is I think extremely important because. Uh, when you when you look at other online platforms, you simply find a lot of conflicting information. You may find, uh, okay, here's here's drummer A, and he tells you do this. The next day, you watch a lesson from drummer B, and he will tell you, um, you better do this. And the next day, right. you listen to drummer C, who tells you, this is all bullshit. You you, I mean, there's no other way than doing this. And uh, mm -hmm. say especially when you have uh, somebody who doesn't know any better or somebody who is afraid of taking own decisions and afraid of, okay, let's imagine I don't know anything. What of these three different solutions does sound most likely to be true? What does really yeah. apply to me? But it takes yeah. a serious amount of courage to come up with that decision to Mm -hmm. to not consider suggestion A, to not consider suggestion B, and to look into suggestion C because you think, okay, that sounds the most likely way to approach the, the, the problem. That takes courage. And uh, taking out all of these conflicting pieces of information um, is, I think, to me, that number one part. And uh, especially with with drumming, where we have mm -hmm. a, um, I mean, the instrument itself is still relatively young, although drums itself are like super old. It's like, I mean, besides human voice, possibly the oldest instrument on the earth, percussive mm -hmm. instruments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But the instrument itself is very young and we're still struggling with a lot of terminology and nomenclature and trying mm -hmm. to save certain parts of the tradition where drumming came from and how it got transported to the next century and to a different part of the world and to the next generation of drummers and and we are losing we are losing certain things all along that way at times yeah. we are losing parts which are say not super relevant at but at times we do lose knowledge which is relevant and at times it is, it is replaced by stuff which uh, is not relevant at all, I'm afraid to say. In the worst. Yeah, I hear you. Yes, indeed. I hear you. 
Where is the best place to uh, find you online and support your work on your journey? Um, well, I'm, I mean, obviously, the, there's my website, klausessler.com, in which yes. you would find uh, information about myself, like my, my setup, my writer, my, my books, my, mm -hmm. I mean, discography, at least a selection of that, and, uh, and anything that there is to know about me, most likely. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, there's a YouTube channel as well. Um, with, to which I do upload things from time to time. I'm not like super active on that, but uh, in case if anybody wants to subscribe to that, of course, you're super welcome. There's more mm -hmm. stuff in the pipeline. And uh, Excellent. Uh, there's, of course, Instagram, which, uh, which I'm relatively active with sort of pretty regular posts, most likely on a, uh, for the most part, I mean, even on a daily basis. And there's also mm -hmm. like a selection of educational stuff and little lessons and uh, like some things that I practice for myself or stuff that came up during a lesson or some piece of little wisdom that I found relevant on a certain day. Beautiful. If you, yeah. if you want to join me there and, 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 uh, And, uh, and, and, and subscribe. Of course, everybody's welcome. There's my books in the online shop uh, and I have quite some of them with, with more coming around still this year. Mm -hmm. uh, there's openmindeddrumming.com, as I just mentioned, which is my, my online platform, which, uh, which is going live out of the beta testing status from August this year. So awesome. yeah, that's, that's pretty much what, what comes to my mind in the first place, yeah. Yeah, FYI, we're going to have all links on the episode notes as well and um, cool. um, details. So for my listeners, please make sure you do go check that out. I sometimes I ask a question uh, on some of my guests, uh, not all the time. And in this case, I feel it appropriate. So uh, as you know, this, this, this podcast is called uh, Tapasya Loading. And tapas in ancient Sanskrit means the act of burning baggage away, for lack of a better term. So my question to you is... Burning what? Bur baggage. Burning baggage. Yeah, in a way, for lack of a better term. Burning baggage you like, yeah. or burning fear away. There's multiple interpretations of this. So my question to you is, if you had a choice to burn something away in that sacred fire, what it would be? My mobile phone. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Gotcha. Beautiful. The, that's, that, that is hands down the most spontaneous and convicted uh, answer I've heard. Well, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I want to respect your time. It's an honor to have had you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it, was, it was super fun to be talking with you. Thanks for having me on the show and um, excited to, to see this, this online and, uh, and, and to spread the word about what you do. Likewise. Honor is all mine. Thank you so much for being game to do this. And I will keep you posted on when this comes out. It'll be a few weeks. But uh, in the meantime, I will be in touch. Be safe, good health, and, uh, and, and, uh, and just like some final good wish. Thank you, Klaus. I sincerely appreciate that. Right back at you. And have a fantastic day. Thanks for coming on again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Gratitude from the bottom of my heart for listening to the very end. Please consider taking a minute to subscribe to our show so you know when the next episode is out. This is a labor of love, one I hope snowballs into one that's sustainable in its attempt to support independent thought and authentic relating. And having you as a regular member of our audience is what makes that a realistic prospect. Much love and talk soon. Just another voice out here.